Today I'm going to show you one simple exercise that addresses multiple techniques from shifting to vibrato, playing in high positions, sound production, and more. It's really become one of my favorite warm-up exercises as well. Hello, this is Daniel Kurganov. Welcome back to my masterclass series. Just a couple of announcements before we get into the exercise. Firstly, all of my videos are going to be available with Spanish subtitles, thanks to my wonderful student, Rocio. I really adore the Spanish speaking community and thanks to this channel, I've had the chance to interact with people from um, Mexico, parts of South America, Spain, and beyond and I see a real abundance of passion and talent. Number two is that I'll be accepting Bitcoin for payments for lessons, um, patronage of any kind, and anything else really. So you can read about that some more in the description, but for most of you, Patreon will still be the best way to support my channel. So if you head over there, you'll see videos that I'm making um, only for subscribers and other perks, and I appreciate any support. Now on to the video. So there are three versions of this exercise, and they're all slightly different, so I like to move between them to get different benefits. We have a page from Hrmali, we have a page from Yost, and we have a page from Gola. Basically, all it is, is an exercise that uses two fingers at a time, shifting around the fingerboard in different ways, in different scale patterns. And from that simple idea, we can get so much benefit. So I'm going to give you a quick outline of each exercise and describe why it's valuable and then how you can get the most out of it and what to pay attention to when practicing it. I've actually combined all three of them into a PDF that you can download for free using my pay hip link that you'll find it in the description. The Hermali book is generally a good and concise collection of fundamental scales and exercises. It's not exhaustive or methodological to a fault, um, but it was the favorite of our and of Heifetz, and I was using it when I was studying with Rudolf Kuhlmann, who is a student of Heifetz, so I got pretty familiar with it then. There's really just one page there, which is my favorite, and that's what we're going to be using today. So it's very simple. You have one octave scales on one string up and down with one, two, like one, two, one, two, one, two, two, one, two, one, two, one, then two, three, and then three, four on each string, that's it. I really like the idea that it's only two fingers at a time, especially because it allows me to work on three and four, which are typically the weakest fingers, um, especially the fourth finger, and namely when you're vibrating and trying to have consistent vibrato. Also, there are many times in repertoire where shifting down to four would be very practical but we choose not to do it because it's kind of a weak finger and we're not sure we'll be able to vibrate it as uh, confidently immediately after arriving. So this is a great exercise for that as well. So we'll start with one, two, and this is on the G string, so it's A major as written. Two, three, so that would be B flat major as written. And three, four. And then we do the same thing on the D string with
So that's the Himali. Now, there are some variations and instructions for how to practice this to get the most out of it. I'm going to talk about that in the end of the video, so do stick around. Um, on to the Yost. So Yost is similar, but now we're sticking to first and third position. We're going back and forth up the strings in a scale pattern. So the first one is also A major. Then we also do B flat with two and three. Then he just shifts it up a half step to B major, it's the same thing. Then he goes to three, four in C major. Then he just shifts it up a half step into D flat major with the same fingering, 3-4. So that's the Yost, and as you can tell, it's very similar to the Hermali with that slight difference that gives you kind of more, um, more of a dynamic motion up the strings and uh, up to the higher register on the E string. The Gala exercise is very similar to the Yost at first, but he really takes it to the next level of analysis. So all of these shifts He sees that as the same shift, which it is. It's a shift of a third, no matter which finger you start on. So what he does is, after doing all the thirds, he starts shifting in fourths and in fifths, and you're still doing only two fingers at a time. And then he does the same thing in second position, third position, fourth, and so on. It's also important to note that this is all in A minor, or A natural minor, and that means that you don't kind of stamp the same pattern in every, on every string. Uh, the intervals are going to change, so that builds in some interesting variation. Then two, three. So then you do it again, but with reversed fingers. So instead of one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, you have two, one, two, one, two, one, two, one. And this really tests your knowledge of the intervals. And now one, two, one, two on the way down. And then you do the same thing with two, three, and three, four. Next, on number two, he actually starts skipping fingers. So it's one, three, one, three, one, three, one, three, one, three, and then uh, two, four, two, four, two, four, two, four. And this is interesting because the shift is still the same. It's the shift of a third. So. Right, so you have repeating notes there, so that's excellent for checking your intonation of that shift. And like in number one, he reverses it. So it's three one three one three one three one and four two four two four two four two. So it's very systematic and it's easy to follow, and you immediately see the benefit of this kind of work. In number three, he presents yet another way of shifting. Now we're still doing a shift of a third. It's kind of like what we did in number two, but the order of the notes is a bit different. So it goes like this. And then... So it's 
So then he moves on to shifting in fourths. So this is where it departs a little bit from Yost and Hermali. As before, we start with one, two. Then two, three. Three, four. Then, as before, he reverses the order of the fingers. So it's two, one, two, one, two, one, two, one, and three, two, three, two, three, two, three, two, four, three, four, three, four, three, four, three. Um, and then in number two, as before, he skips a finger, so it's one, three, one, three. It's kind of an interesting harmony, and it's quite difficult to do at first, but you really get uh, a mastery of the various interval patterns and an understanding that all of these are the same shift. It's a shift of a fourth. So he continues with two, four, two, four, two, four, two, four, um, and then reverses the finger order. So it's three, one, three, one, three, one, three, one, three, one, and two, four, uh, four, two, four, two, four, two, four, two, four, two. Very logical. Uh, then in number three, it's one, four, one four, one four, one four, which goes like this. Right, and then he reverses it, four, one, four, one, four, one. And then finally, in number four, he does this unison exercise that he did in the first section. So those were all the patterns starting in first position. So then Gola takes all of that and then does it all over again starting in second position. So the shift of a third would be second position to fourth, second, fourth, second, fourth, and he'd do that with all those finger patterns. So this is just the beginning of the Gola book. It's filled with all sorts of variations, and it's very analytical, and it analyzes things horizontally and vertically. So shifting up one string as well as uh, across the strings. So here's how you're going to practice all of this. Basically, I like to have a slow speed and a fast speed because you'll get different benefits from each of those. My slow speed is two notes per bow, quite slow, with very slow shifts and full sound. And then my fast speed is typically around eight notes per bow uh, or faster. And sometimes I can vibrate this still, but the point is more uh, to work on the lightness of fingers, the speed of the shifts, and of course the accuracy. So if we take the beginning of Yost, for example. And so on. And the fast version, as I mentioned, I like to do it eight notes per bow. And speaking of shifts, make sure that when you shift up, you do what's called an exchange shift. So you don't do... 
but rather you slide the next finger underneath and then you kind of exchange them. So it's a smooth shift. See how the first finger is kind of right there under the second finger, ready to take over. Right, and do that with all of the fingers. Now, on the way down, you do want to do those ghost notes or intermediary notes. So it would sound like this. Right, so I'm, when I go from G sharp to F sharp, there's an intermediary E there with first finger. And when we practice this slow, we want to show those, right? When we practice this fast, we're going to hide them, so. Regarding shifting in general, there's always a question of how we move our arm and our hand and our fingers during the shift. Some people say, move your thumb first. Some people say, move your fingers first or wrist first. Um, I like to think of the arm always leading uh, the hand where it's going to go, but then the hand also having kind of an independent life, especially in these situations. Uh, so you'll see my arm kind of moves in one swooping motion, but you see my wrist makes a very fast and light motion so that I could hide the shift and, and do these successions of shifts very quickly. And likewise, on the way down, we have the same thing happening. So the arm is primarily moving in one big motion and the wrist is making those micro motions. And of course, in this case, we have many in a row. Uh, in the real world, I find that the arm and the hand will mostly travel together in a kind of flow. I don't really believe in the thumb moving particularly early to kind of lead the way. I know some people suggest that. I think that's kind of confusing and if the thumb is relaxed, it'll move with the hand. I don't think that will be a problem. During expressive shifts and other special situations, of course the rules can be different and I'll have to cover that in a future video. In terms of sound production, the slow variation should be practiced in forte, and you want an even sound from tip to frog. Um, typically, the sound will kind of diminish at the tip, so this is something to keep track of. Flattening the hair will really help with that. And just in general, we want to have a, a deep and settled kind of sound into the string. And this means relaxed shoulder, uh, a really heavy feeling elbow, and loose fingers that will really go deep into the bow. Now to really find that best in the string rich sound, I like to do my waves exercise and this allows me to experiment with the perfect feeling of dropping different amounts of weight into the string. My first video in this series actually deals with that so you can find it in the link above or in the description. And the waves are basically pronation index finger impulses into the string without affecting the speed of the bow at all. So this is the independence of how we put weight into the, into the string and the horizontal nature of our stroke. So. Doing the slow variation with the waves is also very helpful whenever these exercises go into the very high positions, especially on the G string. And it really rids me of this erroneous notion that I have to be careful up there because you know you can't just be so comfortable as you are in the first position. That'll only make your sound weak and lacking in core. So we have to find a way to put weight into the string, even up there. In terms of intonation, the challenges are pretty straightforward. As the intervals shrink up the fingerboard, we have to be very careful to distinguish the whole steps from the half steps. 
um, especially the half step, sometimes you're gonna have to actually replace fingers to make that work. All right, I can't just put three on top of two. It's out of tune, right? And if you have bigger fingers, bigger hands, this is especially more important for you then. Now, in terms of physicality when practicing all these exercises, we want to find ease in the high positions, and this basically means accommodating the hand, accommodating the fingers with the swing of the arm, with the position of the violin and the thumb, right, when we go into the higher positions, the neck has to rest on the thumb like this eventually, right? If we get stuck here, then we're in trouble. Um, and of course, the rotation of the hand. All of this is for the ease of the fingers, right? So in a high position, if you put one, two, three, four down on a string, if you lift them, you should be kind of hovering right above where they're supposed to be, right? So in other words, it shouldn't be extremely difficult and straining to get your fingers there. So by having a very free arm and being able to swing under the instrument this way and the thumb and the rotation, you're able to place the fingers in, in a position where they'll easily be able to reach the notes, right? And so when I go to the D string, A string, E string, that position is going to shift very slightly, right? In higher positions, it's going to shift slightly as well. So this exercise really lets you highlight that, work on that, and make it pretty much automatic. One other tip is that you should be careful not to bend your wrist too much when you're trying to reach notes. If you're doing that, it means one of those three things I mentioned is not there. So either you're getting stuck here, or your arm is kind of getting stuck far behind, so you're forced to reach with the fingers and the hand. Um, or there's just some tension maybe in your shoulder, right? Our shoulders are so important and the freedom of the swing of both of the shoulders in this way is crucial. Like in the right hand, this kind of swing is the foundation of how we play Bach, for example, and many other things. It's like this pendulum. And in the left hand, it's the way we reach all the positions, right? So thinking of the whole breadth of the motion of the arm is very useful. You can even do these kind of shifting exercises where it's an entire octave. Just a quick word on vibrato in the context of this exercise. I like to think of vibrato as a diagnostic tool. It's not just a way to express yourself. It's not just a way uh, to show style or color, but it's a way to check if the position of your hand and your arm are maximally accommodating to the fingers, that every finger can fall in their place without strain, without the strain of having to reach. Um, so if you can vibrate freely, that means you've found that position in your hand, and everything is loose and everything can work together, right? If one of the elements, like if your arm is too far back, it's going to cause strain on all the other parts. So we need them all working in harmony, and if you vibrate freely, that means they're working in harmony. Now in terms of continuous vibrato, I recommend you do continuous vibrato for this in a slow tempo, and it's important to feel the swing or the impulse of the vibrato, so every whoa, 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 not every motion back and forth, but every cycle. So that impulse kind of takes you to the next impulse, you know, when you have a bow change or a note change. And that's how you're able to keep the vibrato continuous. For more videos on vibrato, I have a whole series and you can check those links out above or in the description. I also recommend adding dynamics to both the slow and the fast version of all of these exercises. And this means adding crescendos, diminuendos uh, of different sizes and in different places. The important thing is you have to consider how you're going to do these crescendos and diminuendos. Primarily, you should think of how you're gonna distribute your bow, right? So if you start soft and get loud, 
the idea is always to save bow and then use more and more bow, and then that also means use more and more pressure. So the goal here is to exaggerate because on stage when we have to perform, there's often not enough dynamic contrast because we're too focused on other things. So building that into just your normal um, mode of expression is very useful. So for example, a slow version of a line from Gola could sound like this. So I'm starting piano at the frog and I make a crescendo towards the tip and then I'm sustaining that through the bow change and doing a diminuendo back to the frog, right? So this is the opposite of what our bow wants to do, which is to play strong here and weak here. I can give you another example and this is a fast version of a uh, part from Himali. So it's a slightly different dynamic pattern. So I'm basically making a hairpin on each bow. Here's an interesting thing that I like to add. So for example, if I had a gola pattern that was 1-4, that one, I could actually just double it and get kind of a, a left-hand dexterity exercise. So it would sound like this. And you can do this with the Himali, the Yost, and the Gola uh, in every single variation. And you can even triple or quadruple, so it's like approaching the speed of a trill. Then you really get a workout with dexterity and with coordination. One final thing you can try for this exercise is to use my scroll support method. This is where we support the violin from below by resting it on something. And this will really free up your hand and your arm so that you can focus on all the techniques we've been discussing. I did a long video on this um, that I'll link up here and in the description, so do check that out. So that's all for this video. Thanks for stopping by. I hope it was useful. Please leave any questions or comments down below, and do stop by my Patreon page if you'd like to support this channel further. As always, like and subscribe, and I will see you in the next one. Be well.